how can I um, come back behind that? You know, how, how can an alcoholic get, get uh, those kind of accolades and praise? You know what I mean? A, a drunk like me, uh, let somebody to lift you up and give you the praises. And I just owe that to Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Jojo and I am an alcoholic. And um, I just need, need to make sure that we, I iterate that. And I am going to read step 11, even though my topic is um, faith without works is dead. And most of us know what that means, but I'm going to go through my story a little bit because I need to tell you, show you, or tell you how I came up um, to have faith, which is something I didn't have when I got here. But step 11 says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Now, I'm gonna uh, share that for me, um, and I wanna talk about faith because that's where I'm at today. But I wanna share a little bit about my story, what it used to be like, what happened, and how I came into my faith and where I'm at today, because I think it's so important. You know, I, I know a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't understand people that need to talk about their drunk logs and, and all of that kind of stuff. But let me share something with you. It's so important for me to express where I come from. Not that I have to dwell into it, but I, I need not ever forget where I came from, because that's why I'm here today because I remember where I came from, you know. Uh, I think um, drinking and, and, and uh, doing the things that I did uh, has, has made me into the woman that I am today. You know, and I did a lot of bad things, so if you think about all of the bad shit I did compared to who I am today, all of that bad stuff came back as karma to make me good, if you, uh, if you follow what I'm saying. <laughs> But I want to share, I started drinking and um, when I was about um, 10, 11 years old, I had a habit by the time I was 15, 16, I was a, a little teenage drunk. Um, and anything that goes in there as far as being an alcoholic, even at that young age, was already happening to me. You know, the, um, the rapes, the molestations. Even at 14 years old, I had left my mom's home and I was living by myself, you know. And at 14 years old, you know, you really can't work no job because, you know, you, back then you had to be at least 16 years old to get a job. And, um, you know, so the only work that I knew to do was to go out there on the streets. Everything that I had been taught since I was nine or 10 years old was that if I gave a man what he want, he give me what I want. And all I ever wanted was some money or something to survive with. So that was what I did, you know. Um, and, you know, as I was growing up uh, and uh, becoming uh, a young lady, I mean, most of the men that I dealt with did consider me as a young lady, none whatsoever. You know, to them, I was, um, uh, somebody that that was an easy piece for them that they could you know because once I got drunk I lost the will to care I either blacked out passed out or somebody was knocking me out so I didn't have no choice in my in my disease my disease was already full-blown by the time I was 17 years old 17 years old I was already full-blown alcoholic you know and it just got worse from 17 to 23 just got worse. I got to the place where I couldn't control my bodily functions. Um, you know, it's kind of weird to be going, you know, out to be with somebody and <laughs> you sleeping with them and pee all over them. Okay. That kind of stuff. You know, that's embarrassing when you wake up and they, they look at you real funny, like, uh, what the hell have I gotten myself into? You know, but it was common for me. It wasn't no big deal. You know, it was common. It's something I did all the time. And I mean, I didn't tell them, you know, and you know, we got drunk. And so that's what happened, you know, but it got worse. You know, by the time I got to a place where um, I needed to get some help, you know, I, I was, uh, I weighed 85 pounds 
um, I had completely lost my bodily functions, you know, both of them. And um, I, I was pitiful, pitiful and incomprehensible. Demoralization ain't even the word. And my, and my culture is low down and dirty. That's how I felt, you know. And I never will forget, it was on February the 14th of 1975. I woke up on my mom's couch. And now that's Valentine's Day, you know, but I had been drunk all day and for some reason you know i wanted to be with somebody but i there was nobody to be with me nobody wanted to be with me and i came to on my mom's couch and um isolated and alone nobody in the world i just at that time at that moment um not having anybody in my life um i didn't feel nobody's kind of love i didn't i didn't all I had was an obsession to drink. That's all I had. And by this time, I couldn't even drink because the beer, whatever I was drinking, was foaming in my mouth and I couldn't even get, I was at a place where I couldn't get drunk and I couldn't get sober. I was just in that, that middle place where you just really screwed up. But I got up that morning um, and I don't know how many of you guys, especially like in Australia, Ontario, know anything about the old telephones that used to hang on the wall. Well, I ran, my mom had an old yellow one in the front room on the wall and I, I grabbed that phone and I dialed zero. Now I'm gonna deal with you on this one because this is where something happened and I didn't know what it was, but now today I know what it was, it was faith because I dialed long distance zero, which was zero in my hometown back then. And the long distance operator came on. And I told her, I said, my name is Jojo and I'm an alcoholic. Can you help me? Can you get me some help? And um, through the grace of God, she was, you know, an operator from my hometown. So she knew some numbers and she called the hospital and the hospital got me in touch with a lady that said, I'm going to church this morning, but, um, cause that was February the 15th, uh, February 14th, I woke up but the next day was February 15th. And she says, I'm going to church this morning, but I'll come by and see you after I get out of church. And I said, you promise? And she said, yeah. Now, first of all, my face says she's coming. So I didn't know what to believe, but I needed to wait and see. So, Anyway, she came that evening and um, she was a black woman. I was tore up. I was like, oh my God, you know, and she took me to her office. She had an office in the mental health center. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went to there and I, you know, we got to talking and I was able to tell this lady all my secrets everything i mean i didn't hold nothing back i just knew she was gonna like just reject me or tell me oh my god you worse than what i thought you were and i can't be bothered she didn't do any of that her words to me that night was you know what you don't never have to hurt like this again you don't never if you don't ever want to take another drink you don't have to from this day forward and i said how do i do that she says I'm gonna take you to your, your meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I didn't know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous. All I knew was I needed some help. So she took me to my first meeting, which was February the 16th of 75. And um, when I went in that meeting, there were seven people there. And there were only seven people in that meeting. And um, it was just me and her, African-Americans, the rest of them. And then I recognized one of the guys there who owned a couple of the grocery stores here. And I was like, oh, okay. But there was something magical that happened in that meeting that night. I, you know, the laughter and the eyes. I mean, you, I could see the whites of their eyes in there. They were laughing so hard. They was laughing from their guts. And, you know, one of those, uh, at the meeting was, I didn't, I don't, I don't remember too much about the meeting. All I know is that after that, that meeting, while I was in that night, something else happened for me. I felt something go inside of me. And today, I know it was hope. 
because I was a hopeless individual. And that night I felt, I felt the spirit go inside of me and there was some hope. And I said to myself, if they can stay sober, I got a chance, I can do it. But I didn't know how, but, and they didn't have a lot of meetings back then. Um, here, they, I think they had like two meetings a week or three meetings a week, I can't remember, but it was something like that. And, um, but I, I would go to all of the meetings, she would come by and pick me up, then, you know, I go to the meetings and, and uh, I didn't drink, you know, I didn't drink. And then about, um, I had been around for about six months and my sister in California was getting married. And, um, oh, let me go back. Also, the, one of the reasons I didn't drink is she put me on an abuse. Um, and that, the, she said, you know, if you drink on this, it, they have, they'll it kill you or it'll make you real deathly sick. And, I didn't, you know, I wasn't taking no chance because I already was sick enough. I'm telling you, I had, I shook. I, I didn't have withdrawals. I had leaps and, um, and, and I shook when I drank and had those hangovers for like two, three weeks. It just, it took me forever to cut to, for my nerves and stuff to come down. When I used to go to the meetings, um, I used to just rock and shake because I couldn't sit still. I couldn't control my mind. The thoughts would be going fast and fast and I couldn't keep up with them and I couldn't remember what I had just thought. You know, that kind of stuff. I was insane. But, um, I, you know, at six months, uh, I made a decision. My sister was getting married in California. She has just come out the Navy. So I, I hopped a ride with some people that was coming to California and um, and I came to California, you know, and while I was there, of course, um, I didn't have no place to stay. I mean, I had a friend, a, a boyfriend that I was supposed to meet there, but he was off into the pimping business and I wasn't there. I wasn't doing that no more, you know, so uh, I ended up sleeping in the car for a couple of nights and then somebody let me crash on their couch. And then I ended up going to, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the Normandy house, but um, I went to the Normandy house um, and they let me stay there uh, for a while. Then in November of 1975, I changed my sobriety date, not because I drank, but because I was smoking weed. I never quit smoking weed for those first nine months. And so honesty by this time was getting ready to kick in. My, um, and so I changed my sobriety date and um, ended up um, getting my own little apartment. I never will forget I had a little apartment over on Normandy Avenue, matter of fact. And um, the rent was only like $170, $200, and I had gotten a little job. My first job out in California paid $2.15 an hour. And I worked the hell out of that job. I paid that rent. I fed, made my, you know, and I lived there for about a year you know, and the miracles began to happen. And then I, you know, I met my, my husband. I had already gotten married once before, before I ever got to the program, but that was only lasted four months. That was just something crazy. But then I met um, a guy at, 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 in Hollywood at a meeting. I met him and we ended up three years later getting married and, um, in the process, um, I, you know, I stay uh, clean and sober and all of that kind of stuff. And then, um, you know, something else happened. Now, when I was out there in the streets, before I ever got to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I caught a lot of community diseases and they wasn't the common goal. And so, um, they told me that I'd probably never be able to have any children. You know, I had to have surgery when I was 19 years old. I was traveling around in different um, cities. This time I was in Patterson, New Jersey, and I had to have that surgery done. And, uh, oh, I was angry with God. Oh, I was so angry with him. 
knowing that all my life, all I ever wanted was a baby, something that I could hold and say was mine, that could love me unconditionally. And he took that away. So I was very angry with God, you know. So I stopped believing in God, you know. And then when I got to the program and, uh, and I married this, this young man, and, um, you know, I, I, was, I was telling him my story one night, and I just said, you know, I, I would really like to have a baby, you know. And, and, um, and he said, um, well, what do you want me to do about it, you know? And uh, I just said, I, I don't know, but let's try for an adoption. So we called the Los Angeles Adoption Center and went up there and, um, you know, we talked to one of the social workers and the social worker said, you know, we, we've never had a case like yours because she said, tell us something about yourself. And by this time, you know, my honesty my innermost honesty had come out. So I, I started telling her about myself and she was like, the longer I talked to her, the bigger her eyes got, you know? And her thing was like, oh my God, we ain't never had no body like you, you know? Um, but we are gonna do the best that we can, you know? So my husband and I walked out and I was holding his hand and I said to him, you know, um, they're not gonna let us have one of those babies. He said, why you say that? I said, because we're the kind of people they take kids from. I'm an old whore and you a nut. You know, they don't give kids to us like that. They take kids away from us. And he said, because he had a little more time than I did. He said, you've done the footwork, which is having faith. Now leave the results up to God. And nine months later, they called me and said they had a little boy. And um, they wanted me to go and check this little baby out. And I went in there to this, this lady's house and sat down. She had double chairs. Um, and we sat down and the baby crawled up to me and wrapped his hands up, you know. And I picked him up. And again, another miracle happened. The miracle that you mothers feel when they take that baby and lay it on your chest. And y'all get that warm, fuzzy feeling. I got that feeling that day. When that baby came up into my arms and I said, this is gonna be mine, you know. That's when I knew that I needed to do, uh, I, I knew what motherhood was gonna be like. So we, we were able, two weeks later, we went and got that little boy and took him home. And, um, you know, and, and life began to take hold. In the process, um, I, I passed the, now listen, I was an eighth grade dropout. So I went back to school, I got my GED in Los Angeles at the LA uh, School on Olympic. Um, I took the civil service test for the post office and passed it. So I was able to get a job at the post office as a carrier. And I worked those jobs. My, my uh, husband at the time became a park counselor for the United States uh, Post Office, and we began to raise our baby, you know, and uh, about 10 years later, you know, that relationship fell apart. And um, I, I went on with my life, and unfortunately, I moved away from him. And um, about two years later, or three years later, I ended up marrying a guy from CA. And, um, I was with him for 12 years, you know, but he had a baby, he had a daughter that we, um, we, we raised together, even though, I mean, she was back and forth with her mom, but that was me. Then, um, actually what happened is I left there and went to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, and, um, and because he got, he was in uh, aerospace. My second husband was in aerospace and we went there and lived for a while. And unfortunately, you know, that relationship fell apart because, you know, of infidelity, you know. And I came back and um, uh, stayed in LA for a while. I, I had lost my job at the post office because when I went to Tulsa, I gave my job up, I couldn't transfer. And so when I came back, I got a job in selling cars. And um, 
And I worked that, you know, I worked that uh, un until I got about, uh, about four years, th four years later, I got irritable, restless, and discontent. I didn't know why. Didn't know why. I just, I just did. And um, I made a decision to, to come home. I was, I, 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 I said, I, I said I got homesick. But I know today that God had a mission for me and I didn't know what it was until I got home. But I made a decision to come home in 1999, May 31st, matter of fact, is when I got here. So um, when I got here, I, I, you know, I went into the car business here and made money. And so I was able to buy a house and, um, and life was going really good, you know? Um, I have a, a grand niece um, that was in children's services and her mom had called me and told me that her, uh, the child was in children's services and asked me if I would go get her. So I went and got her, but in order to keep her, I had to go through um, children's services here and get a foster care license. And uh, they gave me one, you know? I did the work, I, I went to all of the classes, they gave me one and I was able to, to legally get this baby. Uh, and she was two and a half months old, and uh, I was able to uh, raise her. And um, during this period of time, um, in night, oh, let's see, two, it would be 13 years ago, I had a, a problem with my back. And my back went out, and went to the doctor. I never had a problem with pills prior because I never took pills. But they gave me a, a subscription, a prescription of Vicodins. And lo and behold, I got hooked on them. I got hooked on Vicodins. And um, it took me four years to completely come clean with everybody, with myself. I didn't drink. God knows I don't know why I didn't. But I knew that I was gone. I knew that I had broke my sobriety. I was 27 years sober when this happened. But I knew I was fucked up. I just knew that. And um, I went on a Thursday night, November the 1st of 2007, I stood up as a newcomer. And um, I wanted to make sure that I didn't have anything in my system when I started counting. So I gave myself 30 days because uh, I didn't want nothing in my system. Um, so December the 1st of 2007, uh, it's my new sobriety date. And so I have 12 years, you know, and, uh, and I'm so grateful. I am so grateful to you guys because I should be dead. But then God has this mission for me because when I got that baby, when I got that little girl, um, and, and I had to get those foster care license, they, um, now this is talking about living on blind life, uh, blind faith, you guys, if y'all understand where I'm coming from, because I had nothing except what I believed in in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, they called me and asked me, they said, well, we don't have any African-American uh, families to, for foster care. Would you consider being a foster care parent for us? And I told them I'd think about it. And I, they kept calling. So finally I said, yes. And as soon as I said yes, about four days, I don't know, maybe even been a week, they called and asked me if I would go to the hospital and picked this little baby up out of the nursery. He was five days old. And um, so I went and got him and, and um, I adopted him. As a single parent, I got to adopt this little baby. He'll be 17 this year, you know? And that ain't the, that ain't the blessing. The blessing is my next blessing. I still being in uh, foster care, I got an 11 year old. And um, he said, I need a mom. I, 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 I want someone to adopt me. I need a big brother. And they were just all over me. And um, 
So I ended up adopting him. And that's my Caucasian baby. I got me a beautiful, beautiful, handsome little white boy that don't like soul food, but that's all right. He's going to learn. <laughs> He'll be 16 this year. So I've been had him going on five years and he's mine. You know, God is good. I mean, those are, those are the things that, you know, um, I, you know, I was agnostic when I came here. I wasn't an atheist. I was agnostic. I believed in something. I knew it was God, but I had just lost faith in him because it just seemed like everything was going wrong. And I used to question God, you know, why, why me? Why was I the one chosen to get on the pills? You know, I'm, there's so many people that says, well, you know, I haven't had no interrupted sobriety. I haven't done it. And sometimes I feel real bad. But then I realized that God had me on a different mission. My mission is not for the newcomer. My mission is for the old timer. It's so easy for us to get messed up on these pills. And I didn't want to be an old timer running around to these meetings knowing that I was high. You know that I was high. I was messed up on these pills and taking cakes and celebrating. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be one of those people. And yes, I have in my 45 years of being on this program, I've seen it happen. But I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to be honest. I wanted to be sober. I wanted to have some quality uh, sobriety. I wanted to, I wanted to be somebody, not somebody they looked at and like, oh man, she fucked up again. I, don't, I didn't want that. I didn't want that. I mean, what God has done for me, no human being could have done this. You know, I, you know, people brag on their age. I'm a brag on mine, you know, I'll, I'll, but you guys probably don't guess it by now. But I'm 68. Now I'll be 69 my birthday, you know, and I'm raising these babies. And, you know, I just went through, today is the 26th, and I am a little bit sentimental, whether you know it or not, but I was in a relationship here. for 20 years and he died a month ago today. <sighs> I'm sorry. <sighs> he had, um, he was diagnosed uh, with cancer, uh, double lung cancer. He was not in the program, he was annoying me. <laughs> but I had been involved with him ever since 2000. I met him a year after I got here and um, so we went through a lot of changes, but we were always together. We didn't live together, but we were always together. And so uh, <clears throat> I took care of him um, until the day he died. You know? And so that's hard, but you know, I have to move on. I have to live, I, yeah, I can't, I can't. I mean, I, I mean, we both of us accepted it when we knew it was gonna really happen. So I'm okay with that, you know, because um, he's gone. There's nothing else I can do about it. Now I got to focus on JoJo, you know. I got to make sure that I'm okay for my kids, you know. Uh, I do work uh, in a drug and, and alcohol rehab that I'm laid off right now, um, but I volunteer because they're such a good company and, um they have always taken care of me in the, all of the, the last five years that I've been working for them. If I needed time off, at, and I just work part time anyway. But I told them that I wanted to to get laid off, and they said okay. I said, but I'll volunteer and come in, you know, a day or two, and take the clients around and do what we need to do. And um, they allowed me to do that. I don't know how much more time I got, you guys. I don't know if I've over talked or not, but. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I want to tell you, I don't know where Teresa went. So, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I, you know, I'm, I'm at a place today where spiritually, you know, I, I'm on these zoom meetings all the time and, uh, I go on Sunday mornings and, and listen to church and, and listen for the music and this, you know, I, I'm, I building my, um, my spiritual being again, you know, um, my kids, you know, went, went, you know, I love my kids to the bottom of my heart. Every one of them, uh, even the ones that's acting out and ugly, 
You know, I have my 19 year old daughter who, who was two and a half months old. No tissue. Y'all have to hold on for a second. But anyway, I'm walking and I had tissue. Um, my uh, 19 year old daughter is going into as a junior in uh, Alabama A&M. Uh, she's in college. Uh, my other son, my 17 year old, well, he's 16 year old, he's a junior in high school. Um, my oldest son, he'll be 41 this year. He lives 70 miles down the road from me. So we all in close proximity with me. Um, you know, faith without works. I, it, real briefly, I, just, I should have spent the whole time on that. But faith without works is dead. If you come in this program and all you do is just sit in the meetings, but you're not doing any work, you're not doing any four steps, you ain't doing no fifth steps, you ain't got a sponsor, you ain't doing no phone calling, you ain't reaching out, you're waiting for people to reach out for you, you're gonna miss the mark. You know, you don't wanna do that. You know, this program is about working and working the hell out of it. You know, the things that we gain from working um, from uh, out of these uh, steps, you know, the 11th step is like when you get to it, you you pretty much uh, at a place where you can kind of smooth it out a little bit with your spirituality. You know, um, I'm just so grateful, you know, the, the things that I gained was my self-respect, my self-worth, you know, living a life beyond my wildest drunken dreams, walking in my own personal brand of dignity. That's what you guys gave me. That's what you gave me. And for that, I'll be forever grateful. I love you all. Thank you for letting me share. God bless you.